Millions of frontline workers keep our economy running and are provided with the latest technology to do their jobs. But digital adoption, especially by frontline workers, is really hard. This is Frontline Innovators. We explore how to overcome challenges and achieve success when we empower our essential workers. I'm Justin Lake. And I'm Gene Signorini. Together, we speak with experts who are leading the way and driving digital transformation to the front line. This podcast is sponsored by Skillful on a mission to help frontline workers learn and use the technology needed to succeed in their jobs. I'm your host, Justin Lake, and I'm really looking forward to another great conversation about digital adoption on the front lines today. Today's guest has extensive retail experience with over 25 years in various leadership roles. He holds certifications from both PMI and ProSci, and he's currently the Vice President of Change Enablement at Whole Foods Market. Please welcome Doug Icorn. Hello, Doug. How are you? Good, Justin. Thanks for having me on today. I'm really excited to have you here and um, want to go ahead and get started as we often do and uh, ask what you think is the biggest challenge you see facing the deskless workforce today. Uh, good question. Um, I, I think one of the biggest challenges that you face is giving those uh, team members, the deskless workforce, enough time to absorb the changes that are coming down. Um, so many times um, there are multiple originators of work or multiple originators of change or requests to that team and team member that they just don't get enough time to actually absorb the change and be able to process through what it means to them, how it impacts their day to day, what it means to, to do work differently before the next change is hitting them up. Right, so just sequencing and timing. I think that's a fair point. And, you know, a lot of the folks that we've had since we've kicked off this change management series have really talked about change saturation, which is probably a, a term you're far more familiar with than I am. I only learned it from other guests on the show. And it really just resonated with me because I look at it as, we, you know, when we get hyper focused on a particular project, we think that that's the only change that that employee is experiencing. But in, in reality, they're dealing with a lot of things all at the same time. And uh, to, to think in the context, exactly as you just said, that we're trying to cram it all into a very short window. And sometimes we may need to expand that time horizon a little bit. Expand the time horizon and sequence. And uh, yeah, I mean, so many times I think people think of change is siloed to their effort, meaning like, hey, we're just changing this one thing. When they what they really need to do is partner with other folks in their organization that may also be changing that same role. So if you look at it from the team member back, how many things, how many projects, how many day in the life type of activities are they doing? Is it coming into a busy period, seasonal time frame for that team member that they have a lot else going on just to meet their daily obligations? And then you're layering on change. You're layering on additional role responsibilities for their for them to take on. And it is a challenge when you have multiple uh, changes, right? So yeah. always think of them as the, the person being changed is at the bottom of the funnel. And not so often we aren't coordinated at the top of the funnel. You're absolutely right. Okay. So I want to come back. I've, I've taken some notes on this. There are a few things you just mentioned that I think are really great. Uh, first about the sequencing and then also the siloed, uh, you know, the, the perspective of change being just siloed to one thing, but I, I want to put a, a quick pause on that. And I want to help our audience get a better understanding of you and your background and, and how you even came into this role. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Go back sure. as far as you feel comfortable. <laughs> um, so I've been in retail a long time. I've been a store team leader uh, store for major big box retailer, uh, worked in merchandising, but bought major product lines like power tools and washers and dryers, uh, moved into space planning, and then uh, spent about three years implementing an integrated planning and execution suite of applications. So really just going everything from where a merchant had a thought all the way down to where it lands in the store on a planogram, inclusive of distribution, supply chain, demand forecasting, as well as assortment planning and space planning. And uh, so... All of those teams had to change as we implemented new technologies as um, both deskless and desk knowledge workers, right? So sure. Sure. Um, 
really that that's what gave me the hook into really enjoying change management and project management and coming to appreciate just because it's a good idea doesn't mean it's going to get adopted or just because it's a better way of doing something doesn't mean people will change to it. Um, there's a lot of uh, inertia and resistance in change. So that's really what set me on my quest around project management, change management. And then uh, this opportunity at Whole Foods came up and I got to blend uh, the change enablement team is really a combination of project management, change management, training and communication. So we have a team of about 40 internally that work on transformational as well as just continuous improvement changes to our stores, facilities and office workers. So um, yeah, just really have enjoyed the journey of getting to figure out how to get buy into new ways of working from team, uh, team members and just teams in general. So I love that part about the resistance and, and not that I love the resistance, but I, I love your recognition of the resistance. And so I, I'd like to, to dig into a lot of bit about that a little bit, which is how did you decide to then turn your focus to trying to resolve those challenges there with the adoption, you know, the resistance of, of employing this new technology? Um, I, I think that, I got hooked on resistance in the fact that it's a gift, right? So every time somebody pushes back against the change or against a technology or an improvement to the process, you really are getting a, an opportunity for sponsorship. You're getting an opportunity to resell the vision and the why, because um, people rarely push back against the actual thing they're talking about. They're pushing back because they don't believe in the change usually in general, right? It, it's not going to meet something in their, their way of thinking, their way of doing business, their role, their responsibility, what they're accountable for. So the, where you see resistance, I, I've always told people it's a gift. That's, what, that's where you want to dive right in and really start addressing it with the team member because it gives you a great chance to sell the story. Where we need to be most afraid of and change, at least, is when the team is quiet. So if you deploy something and you hear nothing, that's a whole lot more scary than having your email box light up or the phone start ringing and, uh, you know, people start telling you why it won't work. They're at least engaged. They're trying it and they're, they're, they're bringing out opportunities for either improvement or understanding. Have you had any of those projects where you've seen silence on the other side? Yes. And the slow no will, will usually, I mean, it's pushing through inertia, which is really hard. And uh, those are the hardest transitions. And usually they're uh, more along the continuous improvement projects. People who own a business process or a technology think they're solving uh, a problem for the end user. And a lot of times the end users aren't experiencing what they think they are. So yeah. that, that's usually the, the challenge there. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. So I, I want to flip it back around and talk about, you know, kind of where we started the conversation and, and what we think is the, the biggest challenge facing the, the deskless workforce. If we were to pull together a, a team of, of folks on the front lines in your organization or, or that which you worked previously, what do you think they would say is the biggest challenge they face today? Do you think they'd perceive it the same way? I think they, they, they would perceive it in context of, um, is the technology actually adding value? So what we don't see is the, uh, the challenge in adopting the technology is, but is it really any better than what we're doing today, right? So while you're giving me an app to do something I might be doing on a clipboard today, the clipboard just seems faster and I can go back and key it in. Like, and it so works every time. It works every time, you know, paper and pencil, there's something to be said for it. The, the efficiency comes when, you know, you're just standing in front of the, the display or you're standing in front of the product or the shelf and you're able to key in the correct quantity and get the suggested quantity or whatever it might be versus having to write it down, go back and research it, log in, lose your paper. Um, but there's that sense of security and how I've always done it. I know my product. I know my business. So um, I, I think that they would challenge the fundamentals. Like, is it really better? And then once they try, a lot of times adoption comes through trial and, and you have to incentivize trial. So 
Yeah, I think that they would probably still challenge the, is it generally better? Yeah, I think that's interesting. So how, how do you suggest for our listeners, what are some ideas around incentivizing that trial? Because that's a really interesting point that you raise. And I'd like to just have you dig into that a little bit further. Yeah, I mean, as many times as possible where you can take away the previous ways of working and remove options. So some, a lot of times what you'll see are people launching pilots. So they'll do these long phase deployments and they never actually shut off the old way of working. It's always there's a safety net, whether it's from a tech standpoint, like there are some, some architectural reasons they can't shut it off until the other one's fully stood up. I get it, but you can always hide those types of applications. But it's when you don't take away the option. Um, if you are truly committed to the change from a tech side and rolling it out, um, create as many one-way doors as you can, or at least the perception of a one-way door to the end user. So taking away options drives trial. Um, you know, then you have you're forced to really deal with the improvement or does it work? But you know, creating that that lack of option to the old way of doing it is a great way to at least get utilization. You may not get proficiency, but you might get utilization. Yeah. That sounds like a little bit of tough love as a, as a tough approach. It, it is, but you can either go hard and fast or slow and long. And the yeah. second is a really painful process. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned another word in there as you were describing uh, that, and it, it's really about the commitment. I, I think that's the other piece is I think we're, we send a signal sometimes to the end users that we're trying to engage in change when we do keep the previous solutions around that we're not even sure ourselves if this is going to work well, right? And then we, we wonder why we don't have full and complete engagement, you know, from the men and women on the receiving end of that. So I, I really like your suggestion about really just pulling it back and saying, we're all in on this together, good, the bad, and the ugly. And we're going to, we're going to go make this thing work. And, and to be all in, uh, you also have to challenge the tech team to really evaluate what's minimum viable or minimum lovable product, right? So a lot of times it's like, well, we just want to get it out the door because it's going to immediately improve something. And that may be true, but if it doesn't integrate into the business process or if it creates additional work for the end user to use the application uh, to sustain the, the, the implementation because we haven't gotten all the way through development, um, that, that's also really hard. So, I mean, if you're going to be committed. You also have to deliver. Well, and that, that raises a whole other topic. And, and you and I talked about this a little bit as we were preparing for today about the, the difference between the end user community and the development teams and uh, kind of the different agendas. Can you share a little bit uh, of your thoughts on agile deliver, uh, development methodologies and, and what you believe to be the impact to the end users? Yeah. So um, I like to say there's doing agile and being agile. Right. So development loves to, to have agile as a way of keeping the, the, the developers busy, sequencing work, all those great, you know, methodology reasons for doing agile. At the other end of the experience, though, there are tens of thousands of team members that may have to be updated and trained and continuously evolving to your application. And, and if you are dropping code on a frequent basis, like every three weeks, you know, every four weeks, and you're changing that user interface, you have to remember there might be part-time workers. There could be workers who have been on leave, who have taken a holiday, a thousand reasons they've missed an update. Now they've come back and they've skipped two drops and it could be a totally different experience or at least, you know, the buttons have all moved. So what we've tried to work with um, our our tech teams around is sort of thinking through agile in that can you do something that would be sort of front of the house or user facing and then cycling it through to something that is improving the tuning of the database or tuning of the application on the back end that may not impact the user's experience so that they get a break right you, you, if you can bundle your updates and drop all the user experience updates you know, less frequently, you'll get better trial and adoption. It's when things continuously prove, um, 
are changing uh, is when you really have that that fatigue of just can't they leave it alone? What's this new button? Or why did the the system feel, you know, change the sequence of the questions? I had my routine down. It's, you know, the rest of the business process sometimes is driven by how the, the technology works. And if you change the flow of the tech, you may be changing a physical route in the distribution center. You might be changing how people are doing things in a store or at a location. That that just is frustrating to the end users. Yeah. So, you know, I know some of the dev team and maybe some of the designers that are pushing out some of those changes may say, but but Doug, the whole point of this agile and iterative approach to development is so that we're just implementing very small changes so that they're always in bite-sized chunks. Do you get pushback from the dev teams and, and when you're having this uh, this tension about this conversation about the end user impact, how does that go? Um, usually not well. Um, I mean, I appreciate the text thing, but going back to what we talked about earlier on, if you think that the, the team member that is using that tech isn't using just one system in the course of their day, they're using maybe a, an operational system or multiple operational systems, they're using a, a HR system, they're using, and if each of those systems is tweaking, at the end of the day, it's just been an annoying update. Right. And, and they're they're flustered and frustrated and they're they're taking their eye off of the customer, delivering the value, meeting their metrics. Right. So they have all of the rest of the story of their day in their life to accomplish. Whereas if you have a way to communicate and bundle and make a meaningful change versus death by a thousand cuts, it, it would definitely improve the utilization proficiency and value realization, right? So I appreciate uh, incrementality, but in change management, we're really going for three things. We're going for utilization, proficiency, and value realization. And, you know, bundling it to get a meaningful value and bundling it to get some utilization that uh, is more than just trial. Yeah. Well, and it speaks, you know, to what you said at the top of the conversation, which is, you know, enabling them to have enough time to absorb the change. And you also mentioned sequencing. T tell me a little bit more about your ideas around sequencing the change. Well, I mean, I think as you think about a business process and it may be something about inventory control understanding the native function of inventory control on the, on the physical sales floor or in a distribution center and how that product flows might make more sense when you, when you drop the code into the application that's supposed to help the team member or the facility worker use that application and code. So if you're sequencing things that or dropping code that impacts the fourth step of a business process, when in fact, you really could get better value out of addressing the first step and then following the path of how they do their job. Um, so many times I've seen that the, the application and the actual business process aren't in sync. So the sequencing is out of, out of whack. And, you know, I think the due diligence is always around requirements gathering and building out the sprint versus understanding the full measure of the, the business process, I use the tech, I do a physical activity, I do another step, and I come back to the next step of the tech. Well, the developer only sees step one and two, not realizing that in between that, there are multiple other steps that they might be bouncing to and from. So it sounds to me that to bridge that gap in your organization, your change teams would actually have to be sitting in in those development meetings. Is that how you've tried to bring or shed light to this process and, and give your end users a, a voice in those sessions so that it's not just about developer efficiency or if you, if you have some other way to try to facilitate that? No, that's really one of the things that we try to do. We, we sit in with a, a solid mapping of the current state, which may or may not be tech enabled, right? As we continue to evolve more and more business processes with automation and technology. But you have to understand all the steps and more importantly, why the step occurs. Because a lot of times a step doesn't intuitively lend itself to uh, understanding, well, they just, they're just doing uh, this step in the process. 
but it's enabling other activities sequentially that may not be, res um, let me find a good uh, example. So putting product on a shelf. So I have to receive the product, I have to uncreate it, I have to get it to the right aisle, put it on the shelf, I have to price it, and I have to scan it in to make sure that the plan grams up to date, right? So all those steps have to occur. Well, I'm also inherently, when I'm labeling it, I'm touching the pricing system. Uh, when I'm scanning it into the planogram, I'm scanning it you know, through a space planning system. The inventory planning team has the in information from receiving it, accepting the, the quantity into the store, and then the cash register decrementing the inventory out of the store, right? So that whole cycle, but that's three different business processes, three different tech systems that the team member is flipping between almost seamlessly in their world. But if you're not documenting all of those steps, you may not realize that you're asking them to do something totally out of sequence. Like why they need to label the product before they can, or print the label before they can go to the shelf. But the tech might just say, you know, scan it and put it on the shelf. It's like, no, they got three other things they got to do that you don't know about. So. And, and that I think, Correct me if I'm wrong, but as a segue into the next thing that you said at the, the top of the conversation about silo, right? The, the idea of siloing. So teams are focused on just the system that they're working on. Those teams tend to be isolated. And yet the end user experience can span across multiple systems just in the course of one workflow, as you just described right there. So is that what you were referring to when you were thinking about how yeah. the, the, the impact of being siloed? Absolutely. So, I mean, and, and that goes into a whole bunch of how to organize your tech teams. And I get it. it it's I'm not technology uh, individual, but on the flip side, not accounting for the end user experience as they engage with the tech also is not a reasonable uh, expectation. Just because you build it doesn't mean it's going to be used. Right. You know, one of our guests recently um, on the podcast had some uh, had spent the early part of his career as a developer, and he brought to the show a different perspective for me in, in that he had great empathy for the dev teams as it related to their blind spots for what happens with the end users, right? Mm -hmm. so he had sat in their shoes and, and so he had a, a great sensitivity to kind of understanding their plight. And, and so I'm wondering is, have you found an effective way to explain to the tech teams the impact of, of what they're doing, right? Not, not to contradict or get them to necessarily stop being efficient, right? But to give them visibility to saying, hey, when you're doing this, this is the downstream effort. Have you found any way to unclog that? Um, when possible, getting the team into the physical location. I mean, there's just appreciating walking in somebody else's shoes and having to do the task is, goes a long way to build empathy. And it's the same for the business people going to the developers. Your, your previous guest was spot on. A lot of times we don't, as business people, appreciate the complexity and the dynamics and what all it takes to bring code to life. Um, but yeah, I would, anytime that we can, we try to get the team into the store to walk the process with a team member with, with, you know, experiencing it as they would, because then all of a sudden some of their, their moments of clarity come when they go like, Oh, we can make that better. And yeah. all of a sudden they just have a different perspective around what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. So when we think about all this digital transformation initiatives and we think about the, the men and women on the front lines that have to receive this, you've already touched on a couple of these topics, but I'd like to dig in a little bit further about communication and about training and educating them. So you're, you're talking about the change enablement in terms of kind of throttling the amount of change that they have to absorb at any given time. But once that's been packaged up and sequenced, as you've, you've talked about, what are your best practices around how you communicate, how you train, and how you provide the support for those changes to ensure successful adoption? Yeah, so great question. A couple of things. One, really good clarity around what is net new and what's continuous improvement. So like being able to explain almost like release notes to, to the team member in the store, you know, hey, this isn't a big deal. It's 
you know, a small tweak or stop, let's pay attention to this new capability and we need to walk you through that. And um, so it, a lot of times it comes in the form of whether we're producing something as simple as a job aid or whether we're, you know, going all the way to a user guide or an e-learning to really walk somebody through it. Um, some of the, you know, anytime that you can leverage the, and the tech team can certainly help us in this area, the help screen or in-app education, right? So, you know, people, one-time training events like e-learnings are great and they have a huge forgetful curve right after the fact, right? I mean, so I take the e-learning and all of a sudden it's not, you know, I'm not in front of the e-learning anymore. I forget all those, all that great content. So any place where we can build into the app or build into the software, um, you know, overview or a, the help button where I can click it. And it's not just the technical application, it's the business process help screen. So it's the entire step that may or may not even be within the app, but it's everything that they either need to become prepared for that step in the application or what that application is gonna kick off downstream. Uh, so those, those are it. Try to keep as much as simple as possible. Um, reinforce it with visual cues. Um, so anytime we can tie an app into a visual queue, whether that's, you know, QR codes, whether that's, um, you know, color coding of bins or, and then the app reflecting the color coding. So if, you know, all things recycling are going into a blue bin, the step in the, the business process as a blue background, right? So, I mean, just those visual cues to help reinforce um, go a long way. Yeah. How do you decide when you were talking about the different types of um, materials that you might create to enable that and provide training and communication? How do you decide what pieces are the right fit for that communication? And is that something that your team does or do you have a, an L&D team that, that kind of focuses on those communications and learning tools? Luckily, it's the, the L&D team sits on my team for operational training. So Okay, great. Um, so what happens is, you know, going back to your earlier question around the process flow and understanding the current state and the future state of the application process flow, what we really challenge our, our business process analysts around is identifying those major mental shifts, the big rocks, where, I, where the team members not only have to do something differently, they might have to think something differently. And, and the larger the thought shift, the larger the, the approach changes, the greater the, the training, the greater the support around that process step in that area of the application. Some things don't need a lot of training. You know, hopefully apps are intuitive enough. I mean, we all get new apps on our phone and we can natively try to figure it out pretty smoothly. Um, so the more app, the more the app is intuitive is goes a long way, but also really looking out for those large mental shifts where team members have to think differently about a process or a step. That's where you want to lean into more content and more training. That, that actually makes a, a lot of sense. And that's something that's near and dear to my heart. I think that we've, we've often talked, you know, I've been involved in the technology space for frontline workers for a long time, and there's been a heavy focus on the technology and, and companies will spend tremendous amounts of money on building the technology and choosing the right devices and writing just the right software. But then really uh, thinking and communicating about how that, is going to now change the business process is often unfortunately left out. And when you really look at why the projects are, are struggling a little bit, many times it's not because the technology isn't doing what it was supposed to do. There's a disconnect between that change in business process that you just spoke about. Yep. The, the getting the value out of the business process, you know, I, technology along with many other things are just enablers, right? At the end of the day, so, most likely a team member has to do a physical activity to bring uh, uh, value to the process. And whether that's, you know, a cashier selling it through the cash register, somebody stocking shelves, somebody, you know, receiving a product in the back room, technology is there as an enabler, but it's never going to actually move the freight. It's never actually in and of itself, unless you have robots, I guess. But right. <laughs> generally, that's not the conversation here. Right. Um, the team members are going to be doing that work. And the more that we can automate for them, great. The more that we can make their lives easier, great. We just need to let them know where they where they used to do something that was meaningfully, where they had to um, 
bring a lot of value to the proposition where the tech's taking over. That, that's where we need the, the content to support the shift. Yeah, see, so you're, you're bringing up another topic that we've actually talked about here in the show quite a bit, which is, you know, one, one of the challenges for end user adoption can be that those end users believe that the ultimate goal is to replace them with the technology. Mm. And, and in a heavy, heavy innovation company like yours today and the parent company, um, you know, I, I can see your frontline folks feeling very threatened by that. Do you see that as something that comes up in conversation or do you feel maybe if it doesn't come up that it's still an underlying tension in, in transformation initiatives? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I think, you know, there's technology is always viewed as trying to streamline and eliminate, right? I mean, if I can do something with a button, I don't need the people. And that's rarely the case. And the hard part is, you know, Projects that I've seen at both my past retail, my, my previous retail experience and here, like self-checkout. Cashiers get very nervous if you install self-checkout. But the truth is, there's rarely enough cashiers to go around. And we, what it really does is it helps the customer check themselves out so that they don't stand in line. And, and you rarely see you know, large decreases in the number of cashiers staffed in a store, because in all honesty, you, you probably didn't have enough cashiers even with self-checkout. Like that role is no less important. It's actually probably more important even if you have self-checkout. So, you know, the, the benefit of self-checkout is customer experience and engagement. It's not necessarily a labor savings, but cashiers probably don't have that view, right? So they, they see, belted lanes going away and freestanding self-checkout lanes going in, you still need monitors. You still need folks to bag and shopping carts and all the rest of the story. There, there's rarely a, ever a labor, you know, impact to a lot of those types of things, but great question. I, yes. Yeah. And you have to really be upfront and transparent. I think the more transparent and authentic you can be about the objective of why you're doing a technology like self-checkout, or any place where you're replacing a, a person with technology in that process, um, the better off the change will go. Doug, this is, I think we're missing, I'm, I'm not suggesting you are missing the opportunity, but I think holistically, as I look to speak with a lot of large companies who are doing very um, creative and innovative things on the front lines, they're missing an opportunity to smooth that transition by communicating better about everything that you just said, right? Because I've been in a lot of those planning meetings in the conference rooms prior to the rollout. And I can't even remember a single case where the business case around that innovation was to reduce labor. It might've been yeah. to extract more output from the labor, it might have been to improve safety and regulatory compliance and things like that, but they've literally, in my experience, it's never been to reduce headcount. And yet, one of the biggest fears that we hear from the frontline workers or the assumptions that they make is that that's exactly what it's designed for. And I think we're, we're exactly as you said, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. This is an easy, it should be easy, low-hanging fruit to be better at communicating so that we can then ease them into really the knowledge aspect of, of making sure that they know, you know, why this is happening and how it's all going to work. That, that, that sponsorship on the why and really driving home the, you know, this is why we're doing it. This is what we're going to get out of it. And this is how it supports our mission, our vision, our purpose, our deliverable to our customer. Um, that, that's really, if you, the more you can do that, because team members resonate with that. Like people like to show up for work and feel like they're making an impact, whether they're at a desk or they're not at a desk. And, and when, you know, you introduce technology that they view as potentially jeopardizing their ability to make that impact, then they will get nervous and they'll be resistant and they'll make the change harder than it needs to be. And uh, that's just human nature. Yeah. You just mentioned the, the desk, you know, workers as well, knowledge workers and, one of the things that's I'm really curious to get your take on is, do you feel that there's a difference in the change management strategies and tactics that you would employ for your frontline workforce and operations versus those that you would employ for the knowledge workers that you, you know, primarily are working at a, at a desk with a desktop or laptop? Do you think those scenarios are the same or, or do they warrant different approaches? They weren't different approaches, different tactics. 
Um, you know, knowledge workers have access to technology all the time, right? No, I can't think of too many people that do not have a computer sitting at their desk, right? right. So they all have access to internal intranets or share drives or where, wherever you can publish, re, you know, training reference material and make it easy for them to continue to do the process. Whereas deskless workers may have limited access to technology. They may not have enough, you know, smartphones, laptops, tablets in a, in a retail environment or in a facility to make that readily accessible electronically. So things like supporting a digital enhancement with a back of house poster or a, you know, cue card or a QR, well, QR code, because most folks do have smartphones. If yep. you're allowed to use them, they're private, but, you know, depending where you can easily get reference material directly to them for the thing they're doing. And it's, you know, training and, you know, training in the flow of work is really where we're trying to get to is training people while they're doing their activity with the relevant knowledge about that activity. Yeah. So when you think about that, you know, when they're in the flow of work, they have other responsibilities. And I feel like the time is managed differently. I've never managed an operation uh, like what we're talking about here in grocery or, or in other, you know, supply chain operations like that. But it seems to me from the interactions I've had with customers that those operations are managed down to the minute in many cases, right? We're looking at employee productivity by the parts moved, you know, how many pieces have they touched? How many cases have they packed? Um, and that's very different from knowledge workers. And I hadn't really thought about this. So when we talk about, you know, trying to implement change, you know, we're talking about people that we're managing to metrics that are down to the minute, down to the five minute segment. And do you feel like uh, we allot enough time for them to absorb all the change and still maintain their performance against those metrics? No. Yeah. I mean, I honestly don't. I mean, I think that goes back to like some of the initial conversation we had around sequencing and multiple changes simultaneously, right? So it, it's not just saying, oh, they can't handle it because the most frontline workers are very, very resilient and can can actually handle quite a bit of change that they're always adapting on the fly. I mean, when you face the public, when you face you know, supply chain issues are, you know, I mean, they're dealing with a lot of variables in their day to day. They are resilient. It's when they have to deal with net new activities or systems while trying to deal with the public and while trying to deal with the other impacts of their, their lives. And most positions, like you were saying, you know, are metric. How many cases, how much freight are you throwing? How many units are you moving? So they have an inherent potentially, you know, compensation tied to their meeting their metric. They have inherently, you know, a lot of pressure to get that accomplished and they don't want to spend a lot of time trying to learn your new process. Right. And I think that's understandable. I think it's fair of them to feel that way. And I, I guess that's really why I, I, you know, I like to explore this a little bit further because we have very legitimate business objectives that we're trying to meet with these transformation initiatives but we have put the men and women on the front lines into a pretty tough position to uh, absorb just an enormous amount of change, especially over the last two years when we've had just absolutely unprecedented circumstances for many of these men and women on the front lines. And, um, you know, I, I think we probably need to, to be a little sympathetic to the circumstance that they find themselves in, that we've had more tech innovation happen over the last couple of years at the same time that they're having to deal with change that doesn't even have to do with the technology, right? So it's it's kind of a double whammy that's hitting a lot of these men and women all at the same time. Yep, so sell the what's in it for me. If you can convince them that it's gonna actually help them hit their metrics faster or right. communicate the value of the change in terms of what's important to them and not what's important to the, the folks creating the change, you, you, you'll sell it a lot more effectively. And it, uh, it, I use the term sell and convince. And even though it's all, we're all here for the same cause and the same good, it's still an internal uh, marketing campaign. You want them to buy your new product in some way. I mean, it, you're absolutely right. And I've thought about it as a, as you know, kind of an internal marketing initiative, but you just said something that's interesting, which is that the return on investment, and, and maybe we wouldn't actually use that term with them. But what we are asking for them is to 
make an investment of their time and their brain power and perhaps even take away some time from their work that's going to impact their metrics. So that's the investment that they're making in this change that we're asking them to make. So what's the return that they get on that, right? And that's, yeah. again, so we might not say, hey, here's the ROI for this, this impact, but we may want to communicate to them a little bit more effectively about, hey, if you make this investment, here's how it's going to pay off for you downstream. Yep, correct. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Yeah, that's a, a really neat insight, Doug. Thank you for, for sharing that idea. So, Doug, you strike me as a guy that you are incredibly deliberate and thoughtful about how you're implementing this team, this change in your organization. You have a, a relatively large team compared with many of the other companies that we've talked about that are really focused on, on these transformation initiatives. Surely along the way, something hasn't worked quite as well as you thought it was going to work. Are there any learnings that you can share with our audience about maybe something that you tried or, or a strategy or tactic that you implemented that you thought for sure this is going to be successful and, and maybe you came back and said, maybe it didn't work so well? Um, assumptions, man. Um, the, the more that you can get the voice of the customer, the more that you can get a pilot of somebody walking through the, the change, walking through the new process, um, when you assume even good intention, even when you assume you're solving a problem for someone else, you may not actually be hitting the mark. And, and I would say the times that you don't take the time in the development cycle to truly understand what you're working and trying to address and you go fast because you believe you know the right answer is the times I've seen the greatest distress and the lack of success. So, um, yeah, I would say getting in front of the customer, whether that's a team member on the sales floor, factory worker, or distribution center worker, like, hey, is this going to work? If you did this, would that make the process go better, the day go better, whatever? And you'll get great feedback. And while it takes time and you have to leave the cube to go do that, um, you will get much more uh, success and utilization proficiency and realizing the value of your improvement than if you just try to think of it yourself. Well, you, you touched on that a little bit earlier about, you know, getting the tech team out in the field. And I, I think that's such an important point. You know, I've been around mobile technology for the majority of my career. And I've often said, you know, shared with the team that we can't build mobile technology solutions from a conference room, right? We have to get out there and we have to see how the men and women in the field are, are actually operating. And there's another thing that I think is a, a part of the theme that you're sharing today, which is that those men and women appreciate being able to have input into how things are, are going to be implemented in their world. And so it just creates a, a much better more constructive cycle of feedback and using that input to then iterate and then being able to uh, get better engagement from those changes because they've actually had a say in what's changing. When, when, when you get the in inevitable resistance from other workers and you can say, well, we had six of this role look at it and they've partnered with us and they used it and they really liked it and we connect you with them that really diffuses the resistance. It really helps adoption when you can say it was co-created. Others in your role had input into how it was developed. And this is how we partnered. Uh, when you get to that level of trust and transparency, you get a lot of, lot of adoption. Yeah, that's great. So, Doug, we're, we're already almost running out of time here, um, but before we go, I want to get your take on what your favorite part is about working around technology and these digital transformation initiatives. I, I just, um, I always enjoy, because I believe in old school retail, the best retail experience is when you can have a team member in a store explaining product and spending time with the customer. And what I get excited about is uh, sort of going back to, we're not trying to eliminate labor, right? We're trying to improve customer experience. We're trying to improve the ability to explain a product, explain uh, why the benefits of something is. And the more we can free up team members to engage with customers on product knowledge, who doesn't want to go into a retail outlet and have somebody knowledgeable tell them about what they're there for, right? Versus the clerk just throwing freight because, you know, it's not an effective process. So, I get most jazz when the, the technology enables team members to inter interact with customers. And, and that, that to me is frictionless customer service. 
Yeah. And, and as a consumer, that's really what we're looking for too, right? We we want to to be able to interact with the associates on the store floor and, and actually get, you know, more value than what we could honestly do on our own. Right. And um, so I, I think that's a really good point. Are, are there things on the flip side of that that maybe you don't enjoy so much about working with technology? And and I'm I'm wondering if you're gonna mention the development teams. <laughs> no, no. They do great work. Development teams, you know. Um, sometimes the, the frustration of we have a process and we're going to value the process over the project, that can be, that can be a challenge for, for any time that we're not willing to have an honest conversation about maybe can we, can we think about how we see, you know, going back to sequence and going back to rotating the development cycles, going, like, I appreciate your iterative approach, but is there a way to work through that that we're not just overwhelming teams with uh, excessive change. Yeah, I I know it's it's not just as simple as just saying, hey, we just need to collaborate better. Um, but but that you know at its core, that's essentially what you're saying is we need to collaborate. We we all need to have probably better visibility into what's happening inside those other functional groups so that we can be more informed. And when we're making decisions that can impact others, you know, we can do that eyes wide open. And I think that's really the theme of, you know, change management as I've come to understand it from all the folks that we've had on the podcast, that really the, the change practitioners are sitting in the middle where kind of being a translator between all of these different groups to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And so it's, it's really why we've invited so many change management professionals uh, to the podcast, because I think at the end of the day, and you and I talked about this when we first met on our prep call, that the tech innovation is rarely really about the tech, right? There, there are humans on the other side of that, and we have to take them into account at every step along the way, or the tech's going to fail. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Before we uh, part here, Doug, I'm curious to know, um, you know, back in the old days, we used to learn and develop professionally by going to events and, you know, different types of conferences and stuff like that. Um, how, how do you go about developing as a professional? Are you going, uh, planning to go to any events in, in 2022? Um, and, and if not, how do you uh, continue to, to develop professionally? Or, or I guess even if still you're going to an event, how do you also uh, do other things there? Yeah. Um, so right now I don't have anything uh, looking at it. So I think always trying to learn a new discipline. So this year I'm, I'm trying to uh, I'm gonna get certified in customer experience design from, uh, so go back, take a look at how to do customer experience better uh, through University of Houston. And then um I think the other thing that I really enjoy is getting the team out in the conferences and having them come back and train their peer groups. We get a lot of value out of somebody who goes out and gets really excited about an element from ProSci or ATD or PMI and they come back and they're like really share and they're passionate and they carry the torch and we all get better because that team member is uh, passionate about their area of expertise. So um, I, we try to focus and really encourage our team to be active in their own personal development and professional development so that they can share it with the rest of us. Yeah, that's a fantastic practice. I, I love the idea about having individuals go out to participate, but bringing those learnings back and, and sharing them with the rest of the team. That's fantastic. You mentioned ProSci and ATD, or would you say that of your team of roughly 40 team members, are they, is that mostly the organizations that they're plugged into or are there others? Yeah. Uh, those two are the, the the largest association of change management ACMP. Yep. Uh, we have several going through active in that organization, and then PMI would you know from my team of project managers. Um, while waterfall is old school, people don't change agilely, so uh, you have to sort of plan it, deploy it, think through the business process. So business processes, I think haven't gotten to agile as much as technology development has. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Well, Doug, I've, I've learned a lot from our conversation today and I really appreciate you carving out time from your busy schedule to come join us. Uh, um, I'd like to extend. Having... Yeah. Well, in addition so that we make sure that the conversation doesn't end after this podcast today, um, we'd like to extend an invitation to you to come and join us on the frontline innovators council. This is a private LinkedIn group that we have set up for all of the uh, guests and hosts 
of uh, the Frontline Innovators podcast. And what we're really hoping to do in that community is just continue these conversations with other uh, peers from uh, you know other industries, other companies that may be in the same industry, but just where we can share all the ideas of of you know how we're all going through the process of making sure that you know tech innovation on the front lines of the global economy can can be successful and and learn from uh, the best practices from others. So after today, we'll send you an invite uh, via LinkedIn to come and join us over there, and we look forward to having you over there. Awesome! Look forward to checking it out and being being part of that. Excellent. Well, I do need to wrap it up there. So thank you again for your time. And to the audience, I hope uh, you found this conversation as enjoyable as I have. Um, If so, please share and rate the podcast. The five-star ratings help ensure that it gets promoted to other professionals like you that are innovating on the front lines. This podcast is sponsored by Skillful, the mobile digital adoption platform for deskless and frontline workers. Visit the website at skillful.com. That's S-K-Y-L-L-F-U-L.com. And if you or someone else you know is out there innovating on the front lines, we'd love to hear about it. Doug, this applies to you too. Uh, If you know somebody else that would be a great uh, candidate to be a guest on the podcast, we'd love to know about it. So um, Doug, either you or others listening to the show today, please reach out to me on LinkedIn and and, um, share a referral. We'd love to have them uh, be a guest on the show. Thank you, Doug, for your time today. And thank you for the audience for listening. 